Welcome to this Code Rage 8 session, avoiding the top five mistakes developers make when going mobile. Here's all my contact information, David I Embarkado.com, Twitter, Skype, and my blog. Uh, it's great to have you all here. This topic has grown out of us talking with a lot of developers and our travels and visiting with customers who uh, obviously have been using our desktop versions of our products from the VCL days. And then when we added FireMonkey in XE2, developers have always asked us, uh, how do we think about moving our applications? Uh, how should we think about looking at uh, mobile as a target? So the first mistake uh, we see developers making is they try to take what they know about desktop, they try to take their desktop applications, and they try to move it to mobile as it is. Of course, on a desktop, we have bigger displays sometimes multi-monitor, uh, large theater 1080p displays, and so on. Uh, we usually have a lot of memory, uh, faster processors, more memory, core, more GPU cores, uh, an external keyboard, although I've got an iPad with a, a Bluetooth keyboard on it, and uh, my Samsung Slate Series 7 uh, has capabilities beyond just being like a desktop. Some people call it a hybrid or two-in-one. It's got a Bluetooth keyboard as well. And some people are using those Bluetooth keyboards on, on other devices. But the external keyboard makes it uh, a little bit easier for things. You don't have that pop-up keyboard coming up from the bottom of the screen. Of course, trying to put a lot of information on the screen. Uh, if you were here on Tuesday, Serena uh, gave a presentation about how to lay out, how to think about organizing the user interface and the user experience of your application. If you have lots going on, of course, you might use up more memory, more battery, um, obviously screen real estate, and ultimately the end, user gonna, end users are going to have trouble trying to figure out how to interact with your application. So when I talk to developers and they say, well, what do I do? Here's what my desktop application looks like. How do I start thinking about uh, moving it over? Now, if it's a simple desktop app, it might just move over very nicely. And so one of the things we identified was to say, what is at the core of your application? What are those high value end user interactions? What are the most used capabilities uh, of, of the users? And to start looking at those types of, of interactions first. So, you know, in, in a desktop system with lots of menus, uh, lots of menu items, some things are options or less used items. You put them off in different, uh, in different menus. So looking at the things that the users are going to interact with most, uh, you can always have multiple tabs. Uh, you can have multiple pages and use a, a, a swipe. And so there's lots of different things you can do to put the less used items maybe on a more button, uh, on a more tab, more dot, dot, dot tab that may be less used versus the first tabs would be the most uh, interactive or the most things that users, again, think about in a touch environment and a tapping environment and a, and a gesture environment, uh, how can you allow your users to do the operations they need with a minimum number of taps, minimum number of gestures, minimum number of navigation around? Uh, you can always have scroll bars. You can scroll around or have a viewport. But again, you know, try to figure out how to put as much interactive and useful information for the customers as uh, and the users as possible. Now in Rad Studio, we have lots of different ways to help you avoid this mistake. Obviously, the the templates are there for getting started when you say file new mobile application, and you can choose one of the templates. Um, components are there uh, with tab controls uh, right at your hands. You've been seeing lots of tab control use. Uh, now, of course, there's been sessions. I think Serena and others talked about different form factors. Uh, uh, on the form, there's form factor. You can specify devices and orientations, form families. That was talked about in a session. Or you can say, hey, when I'm on an iPhone in portrait mode, then bring this form up. When I'm on a, a, an iPad in landscape mode, use this form. Or you can build your applications with layouts and, and anchors and s using those components so that it snaps to the orientation, the form factor, and so on. So you have lots of different choices, five, six, seven. Of course, you can do anything, and you can do it all in code. Uh, as you saw in some of the sessions, you can query the resolution. You can query the device you're on through the device info, 
and then and then have your code do the right things with your forms. So let me bring up the IDE, which I hope there we go. And Jim, help me. Thanks, Jim. I, I had I saw my slide, but it was that other slide for some reason. But we're we're all okay now. So here I am in the IDE. Uh, let me just bring up file new. A Fire Monkey mobile application. So here's those templates. You've probably seen them, but want to show you another time. Of course, blank slate there, a 3D application, if that's what you're going to do. We've seen some examples of that in like game programming, and uh, Paul Vell's done sessions in the past. At least having maybe a heading, a header and footer a toolbar, maybe with some navigation. Uh, here's like that kind of phone selection master detail, and of course, a tablet master detail which is not master detail in the sense of database, you'll see it in a moment, but you know, master selection, bringing up detail information. Tab is one of the common ones you'll see uh, where you can put the tabs. I think that Serena talked about it, Apple, you know, five tabs maximum, the fifth one being more, or if you only have five. Otherwise, uh, um, don't have eight tabs, 10 tabs. Um, Apple will probably kick it out. And then being able to navigate around. So. Uh, just wanted to show that real quickly, and then now I'm going to bring up uh, an example. This is an example that ships with with XE5. This is a, an Interbase Express, Interbase Marine Adventures Master Detail application. And, and when it first starts, it looks pretty simple. It looks like it's got some beautiful little toolbar with lights, lots of graphics. That would fit very nicely, for example, as either tabs. So if you're starting to think of this application, uh, you might have this would be the four tabs and the close would be a close of the application over up on a toolbar, for example. So four tabs, that fits in uh, pretty nicely. Of course, we're not going to have menus. Uh, we could have a, a, another toolbar for choosing different uh, different options and, and getting help and so on. But again, in a mobile in a mobile world, we don't have menus. We don't have pull-down menus. In a Windows and Macintosh world, you, you do have pull-down menus and dialog boxes and, and other things. So let's just run this application on Windows. There it is. So here now, this is the kind of interface. We've got this kind of floating window. And on a desktop, it, it works pretty nicely, right? Because I've got this big desktop, you know, running whatever, 1600 or, or something. I can go and browse orders. So here's orders by customer. All right, and again, you know, we've got all this information and space. We can do things. We can go and select and get all the orders for the specific selected customer. And again, in an environment, and then we've got this floating uh, little window that's back there somewhere. So in a in a desktop kind of world with lots of space, you see things like this that you can that you can use. Of course, you might have this order view attached as part of the main window and have this be kind of a ribbon bar. So you've all seen that kind of operations, and you may have them in your own desktop scroll bars to, to get through and so on. That's pretty cool. Let's go and look at, uh, at a different example. Let's see how we might take customers and orders and, and bring it into a, uh, a user interface. So here I've got my iPhone. You know, it could be a, a tablet, could be a Samsung Galaxy S4, a Nexus tablet, or some other device. And I put down a similar thing to that one part. Here's a, a, a string grid. Here's a navigator for the customers. Here's a navigator for the orders. Here's a string grid for the orders by customer. And I've got a master detail relationship, a connection, customer query, a sales query. Sales query is going through the customer data source right over here, customer source. So as I move the customer, then the detail, the sales query will fire. I'm providing the data set and metadata to two client data sets, and those are being uh, using live bindings to connect up uh, the data sets, the client data sets to the grids. So if I run this on a Macintosh, and I've already pre-built it just to save time, let's go over to uh, the Macintosh side and bring up uh, MD grids. So here's MD Grids. MD Grids is the same as it would look like on Windows. In fact, we could go back to the ID and choose the Windows target, hit run, and we'd have a Windows application that we could grow because we have a much bigger desktop to see more information. And we have this little checkbox at the top. In this case, I've got iOS 7, so it picks up the iOS 7 style. We'll click on the Connect to Database button. And now we've got the customer 
oh, I clicked it twice, sorry. Now we've got the customer data, and we've also got the orders for the customer, right? So we're on or customer number 1001, and we see the orders for customer 1001 with all these columns, and we go to the next customer, and then we get the orders for that customer, and so on, right? And now it's changing. Now you might say, well, what? Since we can't see all the columns, we might uh, just turn to landscape mode, right? So we turn landscape mode, and all of a sudden, yeah, you know, I've got uh, the customer information up there, but the order data is down off the screen. And uh, how do we get to it? Well, again, I could. it's still a working application. Now, obviously, I could have written code that would do more, right, that would just display maybe one row in the grid at the top so I could see more order grids at the bottom. I might have fewer columns. I think that came up, Jim, in, in Ray Kanopka's session on, on components and component design, or, or there was one session where someone asked the question, well, how many columns in a grid do you think you should be able to display? I think it was Ray, because we were talking about the idea of maybe having certain columns that have a thumbnail or representation so that you can fit more data in a glanceable interface than you can the form factor. Now, you might say, well, if I have my iPad, which has uh, retina display and has a bigger desktop, then I would have the support for seeing more columns. That's true, but not everybody's going to have a, a tablet. Or I think, Jim, you've got a, a Nexus 10 with about a, what a 9.7 diagonal or something maybe maybe it is 10 or 10.1 diagonal so you can't always take advantage and of course you could write code but here's an example of what not to do uh, what I wanted to do was take master detail two grids two navigators and just put it on a mobile device all right and that's what we got right we get this thing that doesn't quite work so let's uh, let's close out of this one and let's now you saw in, uh, I think, the session, and it was probably Ray again. I don't know, Ray had some good ones. Uh, all the things you can do with list view versus list box or lists in general. And, and Serena talked about it as well. So here's a master detail database application using a list view. So here we go, connected database. Notice we're using tabs at the bottom now. So we can say, let's go and look at the customer list first, customer information, and maybe sales by customer. So let's connect to the database. And again, this is using IB to go, IB Lite, uh, running on the iOS device. Same thing can run on Android as well. So now we've got our customers in a list. And one of the other benefits we get, if, if you choose to want it, is you can do the swipe, delete, and also the, the select. So there's the swipe, delete. We can choose a customer, and we get more information about the customer and their orders to get the information about the customers that we need. Now, again, we might, uh, in this list view, have a toolbar with some, some arrow buttons, for example, to go to next customer, next customer, next order, and so on. And that's just an example of how you might start thinking about taking a customer order master detail application and moving it from the big desktop where you've got overlapping views, windows, pop-up windows, and so on, and living in kind of a mobile space. Now, one other example, which we created uh, earlier this year for our, our application prototyping webinar that we did, I think in May or June with JT and Steve Haney, here we've got our splash screen. This is a, a recipe application. The scenario was there was the chef that owned a bunch of restaurants. He wanted to make sure that he could deliver in an interbase database all the recipes he wanted all his restaurants to use. And of course, certain chefs have their favorite recipes. So here on the home page, there's a the query was give me the most three recent recipes. So that was a case where we could use a list box because there was only going to be three. It wasn't going to be ten thousand recipes that we want in a list view for being able to to move through quickly. So here's a list box, and, and it's got the style, invisible style, so that it does the nice rounded corners, and we can go and select a different uh, recipe. And now it did a tab slide to bring up the page for the recipe. Here's the name, the ingredients, the instructions. We could go and edit it, and then we can also, with the back button, shows up so we can go back to where we were. Uh, here we click on the recipe tab. Here's a, a list view now. Uh, I've only got a few recipes in there, but it could have thousands of recipes. And then we select one, chicken marsala, and there we're in the recipe, and we could go in and edit again uh, and make changes to it and go on, and there's the, the keyboard popping up and so on. We could also edit it, set it as a favorite, and then save the choice back. 
so it's posted. These were uh, we wanted to go through the prototype of making sure that the the less tech savvy end users in the restaurant, meaning the chefs, uh, would know that something happened when they when they clicked on buttons. So here we go back. Let's go and look at the favorites. Now we've got chicken marsala there, spicy black beans. Go back over, choose lemon bars. I like lemon bars. Uh, edit it. Make that a favorite. Post it back. And then go to favorites. Now we have lemon bars in the favorite. Again, navigating from wherever the user is, here we can go to a screen from the favorites list view, bring up the form, make changes, go back to the home. Uh, here's the three most recent recipes we process. So again, you notice taking what might have been a desktop application with with bigger window or pop up windows or 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 it can again it could have been a tab notebook or it might have a tab control just like you see it here. But taking advantage and also of course on these smartphones, people like these great looking. Uh, uh, displays and and so on to, that change versus people that might be used to more of a grid view and or a database page view on on the desktop so just a few examples of what you see on a desktop how not to move your application to a device and then doing something more refined in the device number two is not making mobile user experience your top priority so again when you're used to a mouse based system keyboard based system big screens People are used to, on these mobile devices, doing gestures and, and touching and scrolling. Uh, they, don't, they don't grab a mouse and start using the mouse wheel. Now, if you have a, t if you have a touch system, uh, like on the Mac, there's the trackpad. You can do a two-finger gesture. Um, we've got our Samsung Slates, Jim and I, and that's a whole touch system, 10-finger touch. So you have lots of control for doing swipes, doing taps, taps and holds, and so on. Um, I've got an older HP TouchSmart notebook, and that works. That has four-finger touch. And at home, I've got a Dell all-in-one, which is a 23-inch screen for doing so. So, again, thinking about in the mobile experience with a touch-based system, gesture-based systems, uh, doing animations, people are used to all of that kind of look and feel that you may or may not do on a desktop application. So you want to focus on good user experience and design. The great thing in Rad Studio, of course, is you can build up applications very quickly. You can do rapid prototyping. You can see incremental changes. You can turn data on at design time. Let's go uh, obviously use sensors that are available that might not be available in a, in a, uh, in a desktop environment. So this case here, we could turn on the database connection, right? We've seen this, I think, several times, the live data, bring on the customer client data set, uh, bring up the sales data set, right? So in a, in a Windows world, uh, let's activate the Windows and hit Run. You know, we can see things live at design time. We can, you know, scroll out and start seeing more columns. Right, so there's lots of things we can do in that world. The nice thing is in the development environment, you can turn on these things, show them to your users, and say, is that how you want the look? Do you want this uh, this nav bar to be a little smaller and have the, the rest of the grids get more of the client space? Do you want to align this grid to the client area down here? That's fine. Uh, there's scroll bars. Do you want to be able to, to let the person scroll? But if it's such a thin scroll bar, and notice there are vertical and horizontal scroll bars on the grids, how are you going to get your finger in there? All right? With a mouse, I've got this nice little, little, uh, right? I've got this nice little uh, mouse cursor where I can go in and, well, be, you know, it shows up a little bigger on Windows because it's a Windows scroll bar uh, under the covers. But when you got on, when you saw it over on the mobile device, you couldn't really see where you might interact with it from a user interface standpoint. As a part of making sure that you're focused on the mobile user experience as your top priority, you're gonna look at a few presentations by Serena DuPont, our product manager for Ad Studio, who will show you how to use the capabilities of XZ5 and FireMonkey to improve the mobile user experience and how to design your applications with mobile in mind. Now, building apps with design patterns users expect is a really important concept and something that everybody should think about when they're building their application. 
and what that really consists of is building an application that includes certain design experiences and also a user experience that most customers nowadays are familiar with and that includes swipe gestures for example for navigating between tabs pinch and zoom if you have a, a PDF for example within your application or an image also following certain standard user input patterns such as shifting the form on keyboard focus which is something that we have a really good demo for that um, ships with the product and it's our keyboard uh, toolbar demo scrollable forms demo actually that is included in the FireMonkey mobile folder also on sourceforge.net if you search for Radspace Studio you can see all of our samples and the latest versions of our samples there as well um, swiping between forms and navigating via buttons, using animated transitions, etc. Another big important point is not to put too many user input controls onto one screen. Toolbar only navigation is pretty common, especially for single screen applications. And as you can see in the screenshot here below, this is a screenshot of our photo editor demo. We just have a toolbar at the top where you can apply different photo effects. And then the second screenshot is a screenshot of the browser application running on an Android phone. And you can see that the navigation is centric around the toolbar. And as you can see here in the top right hand on the screenshot, you see something called an overflow menu. And this is a pop-up style menu that is specific to Android, is always um, positioned on a toolbar via these uh, three squares that you can see. And a little later on, I'm going to show you how to build some of that UI using FireMonkey. Now, tap bar navigation is very common nowadays in mobile applications. Um, you can use it to divide apps into key focus areas. It also provides an intuitive interface since you're breaking up your application into certain categories, so to speak. And as you can see here on the right, one of the key differences between building an application for iOS versus Android is that on Android, tabs are always positioned at the top, just with text, whereas on iOS, tabs are positioned at the bottom with text and a glyph. Now home screen navigation is something that's very popular in many apps today as well as you can see in some of these example screenshots here. You can see on the left screenshot here, uh, the example one, you can see that the iOS app and the Android app actually look very similar. They have a custom UI, but they both have this um, home screen navigation that allows the user to quickly access the different things that they're going to be doing with the application within one focus area. Looking at the mobile column here, T-List View and T-List Box would be used in place of a T-Tree View or T-Grid that you would use, for example, on the desktop. On a mobile device, you would use a T-List View component for long data bound scrollable lists and a T-List Box component for um, small input dialogues, for example, a, an address form or a, a sign-up form or also a settings page. Um, radio groups and radio buttons um, are specifically not common on iOS. Um, on iOS you would use a segmented control to divide up and allow single selection via T-speed buttons and I'll show that a little later on, T-list box or a T-radio button but that is Android specific. Now um, on the desktop you would use a T checkbox and place on mobile you would use a T switch for iOS and Android and on Android you could also use a T checkbox. Now checkboxes and radio buttons are not commonly used on iOS however they are used on Android although for single selection on Android especially in forms such as um, settings it is also very common to use a switch and actually recommend it. Menu bars and main menu those components are desktop specific there are no real menus on mobile they're either, either divided up via a, um, a toolbar with different toolbar buttons like I showed in some of the screenshots, tab controls etc. Now here's a list of the preferred mobile UI components. Now as you're probably familiar, FireMonkey comes with many different components. Of course you can uh, change your UIs, you can use all the different components, but here's a list of the key components for iOS and Android, T-Button, T-Speed Button, T-Label, T-Edit, T-Memo, etc. as you can see here. And those controls are really the default ones and the ones that are intended to be used on mobile. On Android also you have T-Checkbox and T-Radio Button. So the first demo I'm going to show you is the uh, mobile controls demo. This is one of the demos that ships with the product and it shows you all the different 
different styled UI controls. So you can see these all speed buttons and you can see how to, for example, parent and edit inside a layout. It has a lot of good um, layout examples and also styling examples to look at. And as you can see here, I can toggle between iOS 6 and iOS 7. Um, I can also toggle between iOS and Android. Now the next example we're going to look at is a toolbar. Now a lot of apps today will have a toolbar segment of control. This is very common on iOS but it is also seen on Android and if you wanted to have for example all of the segments displayed next to each other which is the standard way of displaying the segments and also have them be centered, the best way to do that would be by parenting a T layout component to our toolbar which is what we've done. Then we've set the AL center alignment property for the layout and as you can see here we have three parented T speed buttons and I've just named them left, middle and right. Each of the speed buttons is styled via segmented button left, segmented button middle and segmented button right as you can see here. Another thing that we've done as well is we've selected all of our speed buttons here via multi-select and we've typed in a group name. Name it whatever you want but what that does is it builds an association between the different controls so that the T speed buttons can actually be used as a segment of control. And then you can see for example here I have the Espress property set. So we have our T layout that's aligned to the center and we have three parented T speed buttons and for each speed button we've set an alignment. So this the left one is AL left, the center one is AL center and the right one is AL right. And this is all done by again using a toolbar, parenting the T layout component and then using several speed buttons. Now the settings project, this is another sample that ships with the product and this shows you how to do a standard settings page for iOS and Android. Let's switch this to our Nexus. You can see how the styling adjusts. In this case what we have is we have switch controls that actually parented to a list box item and as you can see here we've also set the alignment property. What that does is alignment right for example vertically centers our switch and that means it automatically centers it vertically providing the same uh, number of pixels of space above and below the switch. If we had set it to zero you would see that while the control would be actually vertically centered it would run right over to the outline of our the border of our list box. So let's change this to 10. You can see we've done this for all the different items here that have a switch parented to them. As we have a closer look at our settings list, you can see this has a couple key settings. It's just a T-list box. Grouping kind is grouped. And then the style lookup has been set to transparent list box. You can see that um, account info is a group header. And the way you can add those is after you have set the grouping kind to grouped and the style lookup to transparent list box style, you can actually just right click and you'll see a group header item that now is available and then you can also just add the items, the regular items. For each item you have various styling options so if we expand the um, item data property here you can see that we have more, it gives you the arrow, we have a check mark, we have an info button for detail etc. You can also select to add detailed text which would be displayed right here and then for each item we also have the style lookup uh, property for each list box item where you define the actual layout. So you could say I want to have a bottom detail item for example and then personal and account type would appear in a stacked manner. We are also using a tab control with a tab position of none and what it allows us to do is to be able to create a layout with two pages without any visible tabs. And you can see here we can go to tab 2 and we can go back to tab 1. Now here's an example of a common UI that you see on Android and that is an action bar which is just a toolbar with an overflow button. And in this case we have a T-speed button parented to our toolbar and we have it styled as a details tools button. And if we switch here to um, iPhone 5, for example, you can see that on iPhone 5, this will be displayed via a bordered button. In this case, we just have a list box with four items in it. And on click, we are showing or hiding the list box. And also, we have set it to invisible. Right now, I'm holding a Nexus 4 in my hand. And you can see that mirrored onto my um, screen here. 
and here you see my menu and again I can click the overflow button to show and hide my pop-up menu. Now let's have a look at this tabs example. Tabs on iOS are always displayed at the bottom. That's the standard way of displaying them and they should always be displayed with a glyph. Whereas on Android they should be displayed at the top and are traditionally displayed without any glyphs. So we just have um, added an ifdef here on, on form create and that is ifdef Android we're going to change the position to the top. So now I'm going to select this project, deploy it to my Nexus 4 and we can have a look at it. Here on Android, our tab is displayed at the top. Yeah, this is one of the templates that ships with the product called Tab Form with Navigation. Um, all those templates are available and accessible via the File New FireMonkey mobile application uh, wizard. And I've chosen the Tab with Navigation template. You can see here we have tabs, a tab control with an embedded tab, a next button, and then as we go to the back screen, that's the, the previous tab, we have a back button. Now, back buttons are not that common on Android, especially toolbar back buttons. Now, you can, of course, create a UI that um, shows a back button also on Android, but if you look at the code here, what we've done is we've actually said, if you're on Android, we're going to hide this back button, btn back.visible, and that is just the name, btn back is the name that I've assigned or set for my speed button here. And you can also see that um, we've set up an uh, on-form key up event, and uh, we're able to access the hardware key to be able to go back between our tabs. So if we're in tab 6, we can use it to go back to tab item 5. Um, the same can also be seen in the Phone Master Detail application. This is also one of the templates that you can have a look at. In this part, you've seen how to make sure that you keep mobile in mind and focus on the mobile experience. You have all the capabilities in the IDE for rapid prototyping, working with your customer to make sure that the application is easy to use, and ensuring that the mobile experience is at the center of everything that you do on each device. With XZ5, you have full access to the sensors, to the interfaces, the behaviors, gestures, and tabs, and toolbars to ensure that you create an application that works great on a mobile platform. The next area has to do with the, one of the benefits of doing native code and optimized code using the GPU, taking advantage of the screen. Users on desktops, when you click on a button, they expect it to happen fast, you know, getting data very fast. In a browser-based world where you're in your browser and you go over to your server and then the server does some stuff, it goes to the database, it gets stuff, formulates the pages, brings it back. Of course, there's Ajax, so you could be updating parts of the, of the browser container or browser form. Uh, in different aspects based on, you know, Ajax calls that happen for long-running queries, so things start showing up. But whenever there's something in between you and the operating system and the hardware, you're going to lose an affinity. Now, as developers, we love being able to connect. We love being able to call directly in the operating system, write directly to the canvas pixels at a time. Now, HTML5, they've got a canvas. People have said, uh, some of the disappointments people had by using HTML5 and JavaScript and wanting to come back to native code. We talked about the Facebook story. They started with HTML5 on, on iOS and Android, went back and rewrote everything it, with native code on each of the platforms. So in the world of Rad Studio and XE5, everything is statically linked in. It goes right to the ARM processors on these devices. Some of the other tools that are HTML5-based tools, they go through uh, page rendering, CSS engine, uh, JavaScript runtime interpreter, and get to the ARM. Uh, anything that generates a bytecode IL uh, on Android using the Dalvik, the virtual machine, we've seen people uh, do those things. I remember the early days of mobile, some people were running Java J2ME, and you could just see the performance of these older, slower uh, phones that didn't have the fast processors, didn't have GPUs. We have all those great benefits of an optimized native code compilers for the devices that we're on. I'm going to use Rad Studio XZ5 and the optimizing compiler for iOS and Android to show you how Rad Studio XZ5 allows your application to get direct access to the operating system, the hardware, uh, even the chip itself. So here we are in the Rad Studio IDE. We'll create a new FireMonkey mobile application. We'll just start with the blank application. And we'll put a button in our application. And we'll change its text property to click me. 
Then we'll double click on the button to bring up the button click handler. And we'll just change the button's text property to something else. Over in the project manager, we can choose the different target platforms, 32-bit Windows, 64-bit Windows, uh, Android. Here's my Samsung Galaxy S4 device. I've got the iOS simulator and the iOS device, which is talking to my iPhone. We'll set a breakpoint on the line of code in the ID. And then we can choose the different target platforms. Let's start with 32-bit Windows, compile and run, hit the breakpoint. You can see any watch variables, see the local variables. We can go under View, CPU, and see the Intel registers, memory, and instructions for that statement. And then we'll just continue. Let's go and set the target to the Iowa simulator. And the way that simulator works is that we use our Intel compiler and compile for the iOS simulator running on the Macintosh. We'll hit run with debug, build the iOS simulator version using the Intel compiler. We click on the button, we go back to the ID, we're at the breakpoint. We can again view the debug window CPU viewer. And we see that the iOS simulator is still using Intel instructions, install registers, and so on. And then our button has changed. Change our target to the iOS device. I hit run with debugging. And over here on, our, on my iPhone, I can click on the button and it looks like it's hung. Go back to the ID. I'm at my breakpoint. Say view, debug windows, CPU. And now we have ARM instructions and ARM registers in memory. We still have full access to everything that's happening inside of our native code application. Now our, our text property of our button has changed. Let's change the target to our Android. There's my Samsung Galaxy S4. We'll say run with debugging. Here's the native code application running on my Android device. We'll click the button. Now we're back at our breakpoint. And again, view, debug info, CPU. And we've got ARM registers and ARM instructions. So native code, full access to the hardware, full access to the chip, language level debugging, and machine level debugging in the ID and using the whole tool chain. Let's just hit run and it continues. And then we get the result. The second example shows how we can get low-level sensor information from each of the devices, going from optimized code directly to the device, directly to the sensors on the device. So let's run this first on our iOS device. So here's the application starting on my iPhone. We can see all the different sensors, the location sensor, GPS, accelerometer, motion detector, inclinometer, and compass I have on my iPhone 4S. Let's just look at the GPS data. So we're getting latitude, longitude, altitude. That's location sensor, accelerometer. We'll move it around. The orientation sensor, do the tilting. We look at the compass. So as I turn the phone around, we get the heading X, Y, and Z. Let's go and select our Android device, my Samsung Galaxy S4, and hit run. So here's the list of sensors that are found on my Samsung Galaxy S4. We can get the GPS and again, the latitude and longitude. Look at the ambience light sensor, put my hand over the light sensor and watch the lux go almost to zero and bring it back out again. So full access to the sensors that are in both of the devices for iOS and Android. Let's look at one other quick demo. This, this uses the location sensor component. After we get the latitude and longitude, we'll say web browser navigate to the Google Maps URL, passing it the latitude and longitude that use the to string helper functions. So let's run this on our Android device and set the trigger distance to a number of meters and the accuracy and turn on the sensor. We get the latitude and longitude. And in the web browser component, we get the Google Maps showing that we're in the Scotts Valley office. We'll select the iOS device, turn on the location sensor, we get the latitude and longitude, and we'll get the Google Maps location of our office here in Scotts Valley. And using Rad Studio XZ5, you can build true optimized native code applications for iOS and Android, and for Windows and for Macintosh. You can use all your favorite performance tips and tricks, all your algorithms, all your data structures, and you have full access to the operating system and the hardware across all these devices. And that's how Rad Studio XZ5 helps you avoid mistake number three, which is having too much between you and your application and the device hardware and software. You have full access to everything that you need to build 
high-performance mobile applications. Uh, mistake number four was, uh, unless you have lots of time, lots of money, and lots of developers where you can write the application multiple times on different platforms, or you might choose a language that forces you to write in a different way for each of the platforms you're targeting. As you've seen throughout these, these two and a half days of Code Rage 8 and earlier Code Rage Mobile back in June, you're writing one project, sometimes with FDFs, maybe two projects in a project group for mobile and desktop. But again, reusing the same forms, reusing the same styles, reusing the same components, uh, having that same optimized performance with native code on each of the chips, whether it's Intel chips or ARM chips. So single code base, compiled code, pre-built components that are optimized to be their best, especially with all the great uh, component technology partners that we have. We're going to show you how to quickly build your first multi-device application for Windows, OS 10, iOS, and Android. Let's get started. I'm going to say File New, FireMonkey Mobile Application. We'll choose the blank application template, and we'll start with building for iPhone. And once the project is loaded, you can choose the skin that you want your design surface to look like, whether it's an iOS device or an Android device. We have different choices. You can also create your own custom look and feel. We'll set ours to start with iPhone. We're going to put a few controls down, and then we're going to build this application and run it on our iOS device, on our Android device, on Windows, and on Macintosh. So let's put a button down. We'll use the object inspector to set its text property to click me. We'll put a calendar edit control below the button, and we'll add a label control. In this application, we're going to choose a date, hit the button, and have it display the date we chose uh, down here in the label. So we'll double click on the button and say label one dot text is going to get calendar edit one dot date and we need to format that so we'll just say format date time and we'll put a string here for the year the month and the day and let's save this project now we can go in inside of our project manager choose the different target platforms since I've got my Android device connected already my Nexus 7 let's go back and change the skin to Nexus 7 has a little bit different look. Let's hit run. Notice we've got our device selected. It compiles, links, creates the APK file. It's now deploying it to the device. And there it's installing the APK. And I've got this little utility that lets me see what's on the device. Select the calendar. And here's an Android look calendar. Pick a day, pick a year. And when we're done, we get the date, hit click me, and it will take the selection from the calendar that we chose and display it in the label down below. Now we can go back and change the target to our iOS simulator and choose that we want to have the simulator for iPhone. Let's compile and run this application for the simulator. And it pops up. Now we have the simulator. We can go in and choose using the native date picker and hit click me and it changes the date and displays it in the label. And after we test with the simulator, we can go in and connect a device. In my case, I've got my iPhone, so I'll change the display to iPhone in the designer. Over here, we've got our platform assistance server running on the Macintosh. We've got our iPhone connected. I'll bring up this utility we use called Reflector so you can see what happens on the device itself. And let's uh, activate the iOS device target, hit run. It will compile and link the application for the device. It'll send it over via the Macintosh through the USB cable to the, my iPhone. Here's the splash screen for the app. And now we've got the calendar control. We can choose the calendar. Again, we're using the native date picker for the iOS device. It click me and it takes the choice that I made and sends it to the label. Select a different date, and then the click handler for the button will update the label with the date that was selected. To go back into the IDE, we also can build for 32-bit windows. Just select the windows target, hit compile and run, 
now we have the same application, in this case using a Windows calendar. To have a 64-bit Windows or an OS X application, we'll simply go up to the project group and say add a new project. We'll choose Delphi FireMonkey Desktop Application, HD, and we can throw away the unit that was created and just add the same units that we had from the previous project. So we'll say add, go to our calendar edit demo, take that unit, we get the same code, here's the look, Windows, choose a target platform, for example 64-bit Windows, hit run, and now we have a 64-bit Windows version of the same application. Added the target platform OS X. Make sure that we can connect to that same machine. We're connected. Hit run. Here's our Macintosh OS X version of the application. Using the same application design and the same code, we were able to build an Android iOS device, iOS simulator, 32-bit Windows, OS 10, and 64-bit Windows version of the same application using Rad Studio XZ5. So all of that means that you have better experience, you can build applications faster, you just change as you've seen the target platform, and you've got your application running on Windows, Mac, iOS, and Android, and, and wherever we go in the future, again, look at the roadmap. Uh, Linux server, WinRT in the future, maybe some other device with a different processor chip comes out. Again, we can abstract the operating system and the hardware. Even though you might be using FM, you might be using your own code, uh, you might be going through file system interfaces like IOUtils, you can also get to the hardware. You can get to the operating system. Nothing is blocked. Just like in the days on Windows with Delphi, if you wanted to do something, you could get a Windows handle. You get a device context. You could do low-level painting. Um, all of that is available. We don't block anything from you. Uh, it's all in your code. And again, if we don't have the API wrapped in a Delphi unit, you saw Brian show you how to how to do the same thing and how others are doing it on iOS and Android. And the last one is just making sure you think about security. When you're on a mobile device and you're saving some data locally in SQLite or in a document, uh, is it protected? Is it encrypted? Well, SQLite doesn't have encryption. Interbase to go gives you encryption at the database table and column level. And so you'll want to take all the measures possible. If you're talking through multi-tier or through REST services, HTTPS, so you've got security along the wire. For many years, when Windows was the most popular platform, all the hackers, all the the exploits, all the people were attacking Windows, and Microsoft continued to do updates and to secure more of Windows, and still they're being attacked. And I'm, I know I'm always updating my Windows Defender and Microsoft Security Essentials to look for things. But in more recent time, there's been lots of JavaScript attacks, and even more, Android is the one of the most attacked systems right now with malware. If you've got a virtual machine, I, I don't remember how many Java updates I've been getting. It seems like every few days I get a pop-up that says there's a new Java security update. Uh, coming out from Oracle Sun. So for me, I want static libraries, everything linked into my application, running in my sandbox. I want to be able to encrypt and protect all the data that's being transferred around and that's sitting in memory and being saved on the device. Interbase really is the answer. Um, it has the same on this structure for Windows, for Mac, for iOS, for Android, for Linux, and for Solaris. It means it's very easy and secure for data to be worked on on each of those devices, on each of those platforms. So as a developer, you can build and work with a database. You can play with encrypted data. You can then pass that directly onto an iOS or an Android device or deploy it out onto a, a laptop somewhere, knowing that data is secure. It gives your data administrators the chance to create databases, that they want to use uh, as remote caches on different platforms as well. And they'll be able to check it out on their desktop machine and pass it to mobile devices very, very easily done. 
there's on disk encryption built in to the to go edition, the desktop edition, and the server edition. And this provides you the chance to use full 256 or a weaker 56 bit encryption. We have over the wire encryption if you're communicating to a remote server that uses OpenSSL. So first of all, let's um, let's have a quick look at uh, an example of Interface running with some encryption uh, and how we're able to leverage this out onto to mobile. So quite simply here, we've got a, a mobile project that we can target out to both Android and iOS. And we can see here we've got some data showing for the HR employee. And um, this has the salary visible. But if we actually have a look here for the um, standard employee, then the data is not visible. And uh, this is actually, we'll have a look, this is running the same queries, um, just with a slight difference in the connection string to do with the different username. Um, but other than that, everything that's controlling this data uh, and the visibility is managed at the column level within the uh, employee table uh, of this database. So just to show you here, we've got our, our two data connections. The HR employee has uh, the, the full name, salary from the employee going back. And the, uh, the standard employee is exactly the same query. Um, but we get the zeros back. So this is actually data controlled in the data level. And if we actually have a, a look at the parameters here on each of the, the database settings, here we can see we're using the, the HR employee. Uh, and on the other one, it's exactly the same. Uh, I'll actually put up the editor here, but we're, we're using the new employee as the, the data connection. So this is great. This actually really helps control the data and not only we're able to use the users to prevent specific people seeing that data, but that data is actually encrypted on disk and um, even if the, the database was stolen and somebody hacked into your phone or um, if you had a, a customer who, or a, a client who'd uh, rooted their phone and hadn't told you about it and there's big security holes there that people are able to just copy files off. Um, the data is actually encrypted and secured in the database, which is pretty cool. Let's have a quick look at the script that um, made this possible and what you need to run against your database to actually uh, create the user level encryption um, and talk a bit about um, how the different users exist, what the different types of roles they have, and uh, just kind of gives you a broad understanding really about what the, uh, the data encryption stuff can do. Um, and, uh, and how it works. So, Gabe, do you want to take us through the script? Sure, I'd love to. Um, this is a very simple script that we use to alter the employee database to uh, get different levels of encryption and decryption to different users. So, in order to use encryption, the first thing you have to do is alter the database and add the admin option. You also need a SysDSO user the SysDSO user will manage your encryptions. It's not necessarily the SysDBA's job. The SysDBA might not be someone that you want to see the data. It might just be your database administrator. So we created a, an encryption administrator, SysDSO. In this example... So this would be kind of ideal for somebody who's like a data controller in the organization who sets the, uh, the rules around what you do with data. This would be their, their login. They wouldn't be able to kind of modify the data, but they can actually set the security rights around exactly. the data. Exactly. They can say, new employees okay, that's pretty cool. can't see this. HR, we want you to see what you need to see, and vice versa. And different companies can have a variety of different roles. Um, in this example, we also wanted to show that in the same table, you can have different levels of encryption. Uh, in this example, we have the sales user is has a 256 AES, which is strong encryption. The uh, HR user has DES 56, which is our lowest. We call it weak encryption. So um, the flow of it, excuse me, the flow of it is to add the admin options, create your users, then you're going to create your encryptions, assign them to different roles, and then you're going to start uh, picking, in the example that Stephen just showed, we pick the salary. Uh, the HR employee can see the salary, the new employee can't. You could pick any field and 
assign it to a different role. It's probably better to assign it to a role than to specific users that can be hard to manage. So that means that um, if you've got a number of people in the HR department, you can all give them the same HR role. Yes. That makes it very easy. And also if you wanted to have, say, um, somebody in the HR department also played a role in finance, you could give that to you could give them that role as well as a user. Yes, it's, it's much like managing domains. Somebody might be involved in a few domains, but not uh, specifically just one. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes you know, user security very flexible, really, doesn't it? So that's cool. There's one other line that I want to talk about. Um, in the middle, we are creating a backup key. So the, the backup key is for backing up and restoring your database. And it needs to be, when you create this backup key, uh, if you use our tools, it will happen for you, like IB Console Wizard. But if you use it in a script like this, it needs to match the strongest encryption in that table or in that database. So in this example, we're using strong encryptions, 256 bits. If we were to choose a backup key weaker than the strongest encryption, then when it was time to uh, back up and restore, you wouldn't get all the data properly. Okay, so it's basically a will let you have what you can get, so you need to just make sure you're using the strongest one. Really. Exactly. Okay, that's pretty cool. And, and obviously this is a, an example where we're looking at um, controlling encryption at the column level on the database because encryption has a slight overhead to it, but um, uh, in encrypting only the specific bits that we need to can, can be quite a beneficial kind of from a performance point. but Equally, if we just want to be, hey, it's not a massive database, there's not a lot of data in there, we want to just throw it all in quite happily. Or we've got super servers and we're quite happy for it to encrypt and decrypt everything because it goes all the time. You, you can roll just full database encryption without having to worry about setting individual columns, yeah. can't you? Yes, you can. You can encrypt every database or just what you consider the security risks and then or as in this example, you can just say, I just want one column in this database that nobody can see. I'm going to go straight into um, actually using Delphi XC5 to, to build a, a secure uh, data snap server with very uh, basic uh, functionality. Uh, so I'm going to use uh, all uh, discussed uh, security measures. I'm going to use HTTPS encryption filters uh, to um, have a secure uh, communication. Inside of Delphi, uh, I'm going to create a brand new uh, data snap uh, server. So, file new, other, and in the data snap uh, category, uh, we have uh, different uh, servers. I'm going to go for this data snap standalone server, which is probably the most convenient for uh, demonstration and uh, deployment and gives me uh, all possibilities. So, Clicking on OK, the first uh, option is how my uh, server is going to be uh, packaged. So it could be a VCL forms application or console application or service application. So probably the most easy is the VCL forms application. This is probably the most important uh, uh, tab here in the data snap uh, server. So here by default, we have a selected uh, TCP IP uh, communication. But what I really need is to enable HTTPS uh, communication. So I need to make sure that this HTTPS uh, is selected. Even though I'm going to use uh, HTTPS only as my communication uh, um, protocol, and here is very important, I'm going to uh, enable encryption uh, um, filters. Also, to make it even more difficult to inspect the, the traffic, I'm going to add a compression filter, which will basically uh, additionally compress the um, row byte of stream that are sent between client to server uh, using a Zlib um, algorithm. And on the next screen, this screen uh, is actually uh, here to specify the SSL uh, certificates uh, that my server is going to uh, use. At this point, if we would be creating a productional um, server that to deploy to the production, I would probably 
obtain a commercial certificate from uh, some uh, commercial uh, certi certificate uh, authorities like uh, uh, VeriSign or Toft. Uh, but for uh, development purposes, uh, I can uh, generate uh, test uh, certificates uh, myself. Here I can actually go to certificate file name. So on my uh, C drive in the keys directory, there is a, a public uh, key. So this is the, in uh, HTTPS, we have two keys. There is one that is a public key. This is the one test with a PEM uh, extension. The other one is, is actually a, a secret key that should not be shared. I have added, I have made sure that it has a different extension, the key extension. So now once uh, these two are uh, added, I can test if uh, the wizard actually uh, see if uh, the, these certificates are working okay. So the test succeeded, so I'm quite happy with this. So I can go ahead. Let's have a look uh, what have been uh, generated for us. Uh, so inside of the server container form, uh, we have a number of components. So we have components that are typical for every uh, data snap server, so DS server, uh, DS server class, both encryption filters and compression filters. So there are two um, encryption filters, RSA uh, with some properties and PC1 with the actual key. So this key is actually generated by the wizard, uh, but uh, and it's actually um, it's, it's a secret because it's a, a compiled into the server application, but uh, in many situations you may want to generate uh, your own key here, but I'm going to stick with the default values. And there is also a Zlib uh, compression filter, so uh, all filters are uh, enabled. Make sure that a server is uh, running, it's running uh, locally. I'm just using this for uh, testing my client and now I can uh, start my data snap client module uh, to uh, generate uh, um, client uh, client uh, code. So I'm specifying again 8081 HTTPS uh, local and uh, click on test connection. So I can actually specify my admin. I know that this is the uh, the connection that is uh, okay. So the test connection succeeded. I can click on finish and the wizard should generate for me uh, two uh, files, uh, one file with the client module unit. So this is something that is going to be shared. So the same uh, functionality can be also used uh, on the mobile device. So I'm going to switch uh, to uh, Android. I have exactly the same uh, source code here. Uh, so there are two uh, tabs. Uh, the, on the first tab I can specify uh, the connection settings and uh, there is also an action list with two uh, change tab actions. Uh, so if the, uh, this is successful uh, I can actually change uh, the, the tab to a second tab and on the second tab I have a functionality to get the price and set the price and possibility to go back uh, to the uh, connection screen. So let me actually uh, try to uh, compile this application uh, for Android. I can click on connect and now uh, I'm in the get price so I can get price and I can uh, set price. So all of that is available uh, in Rad Studio. We're native code, nothing between you, no other thing. If you're using a third-party library or component set, make sure you know who it's from. If you have the source code, you can look through it. We give you all the source code of the RTL, FireMonkey, all of that is available uh, for you to, to take a look at. Interbase to go has encryption again as the database table and column level. You saw that. And with DataSnap, uh, HTTPS, encrypted JSON packets, it's all there. So, Jim, I'm going to end it there and open it up for any questions. So here's a question about 10 touch points. What would be uh, the best practice, technically not considering ergonomics, to make use of all 10 touches within FireMonkey? Is there a cross-platform way to deal with so many touch points? You know, there's the interactive gestures, I yeah, think. Yeah, you have interactive gestures. So for example, two would be for pinch and zoom and rotate. That would be interactive gesture with two touch points. For 10, I'd probably use 10 for a painting program. You mentioned an example where in a project group, we may have one project for mobile and one for desktop. Yep. Can you elaborate on that scenario when you want to take that and when you want to take that approach? Yeah. So I, and, and actually, if you go to the start here, 
If you go to the your start in the I, XZ5 ID, there's start here. There's videos, and you, if you look at the video, your first app. Uh, I do that exactly. I create the mobile application first, and then I uh, here. Let's load this one up uh, real quick, and let's set this to uh, iOS so we can see it on the device. As far as when you'd want to do that, it, it's convenient to for some utility apps. That's what I find a lot of times. I write these little utility apps that I just want to get useful on as many pro platforms as possible, and so I'll use that scenario. But then you can also take advantage of uh, just sharing different amounts of code between your applications and create entirely different user interfaces on the desktop yeah. versus mobile device and still have those in the same project group sharing quite a bit of code, maybe through frames or form families or whatever. Yeah, in the case of the Start Here video, um, since I started with mobile, mobile allows you to create iOS, iOS simu device, iOS simulator, Android emulator, and Android device targets, and Win32 because the designer uh, needs the design packages to do your design work in a 32-bit IDE. And so in that case, if I wanted to do Win64 or OS 10, I just did a new project uh, in the project group and chose the target Win64 and Win32 and OS 10, and I deleted on the in the new project the default unit that's created, and I just added the unit that was from the, the units from the mobile, and then hit run, and I had a Win64 app, Win32 app, and an OS 10 app. Uh, so here again, uh, you know, we've got this nice look and feel. Oh, shoot. Yeah, right. Go here, and there's the test. So eat. Um, and now select it. Now notice it's uh, it's delete without the X. So it picks up the styles. The default styles for buttons are available automatically for you if you're moving back and forth between platforms. But the other case, yeah, obviously you can use form families and you could have multiple forms. You could see what platform you're on. Say, oh, I'm running on Windows. I want a different main form. Uh, I want to add, I want menus. Now on iOS, I'd want to have some kind of a button bar. Uh, a toolbar where I'd put some buttons, maybe with a horizontal scroll if I've got several menu items. Is there an example of an application which is not suitable <clears throat> for mobile deployment? For example, AutoCAD comes to mind. Yeah, you know, what I've seen is some people like Photoshop Express, where they give you some, you know, versus full Photoshop, where they do a lot of the processing in the cloud and they give you sort of a subset interface uh, on the mobile. I've seen uh, model viewers or AutoCAD drawing viewers and, and manipulation, doing gestures to rotate around and fly through, but not necessarily unless it was on a tablet, uh, do all the manipulation of all the 3D objects. Uh, so Photoshop Express is one that comes to mind where you could do a little bit of coloring and other things, but really you wanted to then load it into full Photoshop on the desktop. Yeah, generally uh, you would need to rethink it, but the thing to think about though is the, as a rule of thumb, the smaller the screen, the shorter amount of time a user spends on it in any given session. Yep. And so if it's something you're thinking you're going to spend, maybe it, maybe in AutoCAD, you could go in there and if it's going to be a five minute or a one minute fix or a tweak or something like that, or to view a model someone else made on the desktop, that might be a, a scenario that would make sense for AutoCAD on mobile device. But yeah, generally anything is going to take a lot of processing time, even processing time. They get so much processing power in these mobile devices, it's crazy. But uh, think about smaller usage scenarios and then you're probably moving in the right direction would it be acceptable design for a three for a 3d app to have portrait view display a side view and then devices turn landscape change to a top view if that makes sense for your app yeah i mean there, i've seen a lot of things where they're interesting where they do interesting changes based on the view the portrait view versus landscape view yep. so as long as it makes sense for your app and again look at forum families look at uh serena's session um and you can also, it was talked about in several of sessions where you can see and be triggered on, I guess you get an on resize event when you do an orientation change. You could also have an orientation sensor that you could use to trigger uh, when you do things, when things move. But you can get an on resize event on the form when you turn the, if you don't lock the orientation. So here's a, a Joe wants to know, it says, my application is data entry heavy. On the desktop, it is typically a vertical scrolling screen to get through the, all the fields. Is a long scrolling screen considered bad for mobile apps? I would probably have different, well, you can have a vertical scroll, but uh, 
I I haven't seen many apps that do that. Usually, what happens is, and there's a tabs not tab sliding. There's a, there's one project where you have multiple pages, and as you do parts of the data entry, it moves you to the next tab item, the next tab item, next tab item. It's one of the examples. So here's the a settings page where you might do so. Notice the sliding and then the back button, some switches. Uh, you know, something where you're navigating through and then you've got some uh, some input. Are there snippets yeah. on uni using NFC functionality? Uh, not yet. There is no, uh, we haven't exposed NFC in a component, but right. it's uh, certainly accessible using the APIs. If you check out Brian Long's uh, example code on his website, blog.blong.com from this morning, or you can catch the replay later. He talks about how to get to the uh, the API. Tab slide transition. I think this is the pro that data entry one yeah here it is so let's run this on android so here's a case where you have lots of input and you're just using tab items uh, to move a data entry page to another data entry page and actually looks very pleasant to the users on the on the smart device because of that nice sliding so this one you'll see this one is uh in firemonkey it's a tab slide transition so again for lots of data entry on, on a little handheld device like this, this might be a way to go. There's a lot of comments in here saying, thanks for the great presentation. A few people said this has made co their code rage for them, so. So again, now, okay, select I, okay, that's what I want. And then you hit next button, right, in slides. Now we do this, and if you have required fields, it won't let you go until you key in the data. So let's key in something and something. Hopefully it won't validate that one. Right, and it's just sliding, right? So next, next, you can always go back, back till you're there. and That looks better when you're yeah. live, but yes. And there's my email address, so uh, you can always send me email. Yep, davidi at embarcadero.com. Yeah, simple.